Today we will be presenting the final presentation for the Alpha Jet. Team Alpha consists of four members, uh, Pablo Dixon being the design leader, Nathan Sisson be being the structure leader, Haja Chen being the manager and the loads leader, and myself, who I am Rosanna, um, being the material leader. The Alpha Jet will be the light will be a light business jet and it will be the best in its class. This is going to be proven by the damage tolerance analysis and it will satisfy the 1000 hour inspection interval, um, decreasing the, the maintenance uh, time, uh, allowing the airplane to be back, on, back in the skies quicker. And also we will be reducing the weight to optimize the design. The first step in our design was to collect a database of competitor aircraft in the light business jet category. This was to ensure that our calculated values would make sense and give us something to compare them against. The basic parameters for our aircraft wing design would be a wingspan of 40 feet with a core root of 6.2 feet with a 0.5 taper ratio giving us a core tip of 3.1 feet. Our takeoff weight was estimated to be approximately 12,800 pounds. This was based off our weight estimation from a 2,000 nautical mile range with a 45 minute loiter time. The load factor according to 14 CFR part 25 must be great, greater than 2.5 but no more than 3.8. From our calculations, we got approximately 3.2 for our load factor. Our ultimate load factor is 4.8 based on our safety factor of 1.5. These figures show the load distribution on the fuselage and the wing. The fuselage load distribution analysis was necessary to find the fuselage apparent weight which takes into account the downward tail lift force as well as the fuselage structure, wing structure, tail structure, fuel, payload, and engines. This apparent weight represents the amount of lifting force acting on the wing. The fuselage loading arrangement was chosen carefully to ensure static stability about the CG. The wing load distribution only included the lift force, wing structure, and fuel weight as the engines and aft landing gear are fuselage mounted. The weight distributions on the wing were integrated to find the internal shear force and bending moments along the semi-span of the wing. The plots are for a load factor of 1, but can be multiplied by any load factor to obtain the corresponding forces and moments. The most important result is the bending moment at the wing root. From it, we can obtain the value of the axial forces that exist in the wing structure, which will drive the wing su structure sizing. The shear force is not as important in the analysis as they are much smaller in magnitude than the axial forces. The shear force and bending moment calculations provided the internal forces at the wing root, the location where the wing to fuselage attachment brackets are located. Before these values were used in the sizing and further analysis, a factor of safety of 1.5 was applied at the maximum load factor of 3.2. The values below represent this. The airfoil we selected for the Alpha Jet is the NACA 652415. This airfoil was selected as it's a supercritical airfoil that will be efficient in the speeds that our jet intends to fly in. It was also chosen for the ample interior space, which would provide room to fit all of our interior components. This slide shows how we found the aerodynamic center at the root of our wing. We use the geometrical approach, and this allows us to find out where we should set the shear center for our idealized shear box. The next step was to design our idealized shear box. The top figure shows our actual spar locations inside the wing. The middle figure shows what the actual shear box would look like inside the wing. However, to do the idealized shear box, we cannot have a trapezoidal shape. Therefore, we take the average height of the front and rear spar and combine this into a rectangle to make our idealized shear box. The shear center was intentionally designed to be the location where the resultant shear force acts at the aerodynamic center location that was found earlier. The reason why the shear center was designed in this way is because the team wanted to avoid any twist on the wing. After confirming where the shear center is, the team received outputs from the wing box sizing program, which include the area of the front spar cap, rear spar cap, and the midpoint stringers. 
The shear flow goes around the wing box will also attend from the program and this helps the, this helps the team to decide the thickness value for the front web, rear web, and the skin. The left picture and the right picture shows the wing box sizing program output at the wing root and 50% wing span respectively. The shear flows on the top of the wing box are converging. It means the wing structure is subjected to a compression stress on the top skin and buckling could happen in this situation. On the contrary, the shear flows on the bottom of the wing box are diverging and it means the wing structure is subjected to a tensile stress on the bottom skin. The reason why the shear box designing was was repeated at the 50% wingspan is because the spar and the stringers could be tapered from the wing root to the wing tip by using interpolation. And then the total volume of the components can be decreased, which, le which lead to the weight reduced. The main material we chose is, alumin is aluminum. We used aluminum 2024 for both the front and the rear spar along with the bottom skin. It is easy um, to machine. The copper within the aluminum makes the alloy have a greater resistance towards fatigue, which is why we chose it for the spars. Performs well in tension, um, reason being on the bottom skin. Uh, aluminum 7050 has a high strength uh, durability within its lifespan. The high stre stress corrosion cracking is beneficial with all the rivets um, and is easy to maintain. For maintenance, aluminum 7075 uh, was chosen for the brackets, reason being it has a high strength to weight ratio, the high stre stress concentration, this is later explained, and contains a tensile strength of 73.1 KSI. The bolts chosen for the brackets um, were all uh, steel AISI 8740, reason being is they have high strength and toughness along with hardenability. However, they are low in corrosion, but this will be prevented uh, with the protection of anodic. And the, for, and the rivets will be using aluminum, reason being it's high strength, um, lightweight, and will have a dim dimples. This is for the structural component. Buckling analysis was conducted by the team to ensure the wing structure is not only able to withstand the sheer buckling on the wing and on the skin and webs, but also able to withstand the compressive stress on the top skin. After the team deriving from the midpoint stringers, there were six small stringers distributed on the top skin and six small stringers on the bottom skin, with the typical spacing of 5.63 inches. In the shear buckling analysis, the team had assumed the critical shear stress for the front and the rear web and the top skin to be equal to the shear stress that each component, each component was experiencing based on the shear box design. The buckling chart shows the shear buckling factor K for front and the rear web and the top skin are exceptionally low, which means these components will not be suffered from the shear buckling and the structure will be safe. The compressive stress buckling analysis was also conducted to guarantee that the wing spar cap and the stringers will not deform at the limit load or break at the ultimate load of the selected material. The team used 45,000 PSI as critical stress for the top skin and calculated the panel buckling factor K, which was shown in the chart. The resultant rib spacing at the wing root need to be equal to or smaller than three times stringer spacing, which is 16.89 inches, to avoid any buckling failure. The team chose 15 inches as the rib spacing starting from the wing root to 50% wingspan, which is shown in the top view figure of the wing. For the rib spacing starting from 50% wingspan to the wing tip, the team cycled another shear and compressive stress buckling analysis 
based on the wing box design for the 50% wingspan, and all the resultant K values were extremely low, which technically meant no rib needed at all. However, the team decided to place three ribs for the section of the wing with the spacing of 30 inches so that the structure safety could be ensured. The first step in the damage tolerance analysis is to determine the fatigue critical locations, or FCLs. These locations are areas along the part that are most likely to initiate a crack. Crack propagation often starts in areas of the part with stress concentrations, and this is a factor of the geometry of the part. For the front main lug, we chose three locations that we determined could be possible critical locations. The main lug, the area of curvature just past the lug, as well as one of the bolt hole locations for the spar attachment. The, these theories were tested in FEMAP to understand if these were accurate. These plots show the results of the max prin principal stress through that was solved through the FEMAP. After importing the CATIA file into FEMAP, it was important to increase the mess sizes around the bolt hole locations. This was to give a more accurate result from the FEMAP analysis. These plots show the von Mises stress concentrations and confirm our theories for the possible FCL locations. Once the failure critical locations were determined, the next step was to analyze these locations with a crack growth simulation software. We need to ensure that if a crack was to grow at any of the FCLs, it will not reach critical size before the economic life of 100,000 flat hours that was imposed as a requirement. Additionally, we need to ensure that the NDI inspection intervals were not less than 1,000 flat hours. The software used was Crack 2000. The form and crack growth rate equation was used, and retardation effects were considered in the analysis with a Wheeler coefficient of 1.3. Also, an initial crack size of 0 0.005 inches was used. The loading spectrum chosen was the twist spectrum. The twist spectrum was specifically for wing root analysis. In the analysis, an average flight time of three hours was chosen. The plots below show the crack growth over time for each of the three FCLs. The results show that at each FCL, the cracks do not become critical until after the 100,000 hour economic life restriction. Also note the high rate of crack growth for the front spar bracket bin as compared to the front spar lug and spar bracket attachment. These plots show the residual strength decay with crack growth for each of the failure critical locations. All three show good trends with very small decay rates. From the DT analysis, it's clear that the bracket lug is the least critical failure critical location because it surpasses the economic life requirement and NDI interval requirement. While the bracket attachment FCL surpasses the NDI interval requirement, it barely meets the economic life requirement. The major concern is the second failure critical location, the bracket bend. The analysis shows that this part will require an NDI inspection of 974 hours. In order to try to meet this 1,000 hour inspection interval requirement, it is possible that a different NDI method that requires longer inspection intervals can be chosen. Otherwise, resizing of the bracket at that location could be necessary. Now we will show the design details of each of the major wing structure components. To design the front spar, we first took the required spar cap areas and built that into the design of the spar. The spar shape we chose was the C-shaped spar, and we designed it as a fully one-piece machined spar. We chose the machining as this enabled us to taper the spar as it went along the span of the wing. This allowed us to save weight where we did not need the strength. The rear spar was designed in a similar manner to the front spar, as a C-shaped one-piece machine design. The rear spar is much smaller compared to the front spar, as the location of the shear center determined that the majority of the load would be going through the front spar. The first step in the design of the front bracket was to size the lug bolt hole. Then we ensured that the cross-sectional area of the lug was able to safely transmit the ultimate tensile stresses without failure. 
A transition in width was needed as the bracket needed to be the same width as a spar cap that it attached to. This portion of the bracket was also sized to safely transmit the ultimate tensile stress. The step geometry of the bracket at the location of spar cap attachment location was necessary to ensure an even load distribution to the attachment bolts. Edge distance and spacing for these nine bolts holes was also considered as to not exceed the acceptable spacing of 1.5 times the diameter to the edge and four times the diameter between the bolts. The rear bracket was designed similarly to the front brackets. However, we chose the one piece design for the rear bracket as the height of the rear spar was small in comparison. A similar step design was used to ensure even bolt load distribution and a single bolt was enough to carry the small amount of load that was carried by the rear spar. The design of the stringer was a Z shape. We chose this design as it is a very common and proven design and it is simple to manufacture as it only requires two bends to manufacture. Rip spacing was calculated and confirmed in the buckling analysis, which end up with the configuration as the drawing shows. The shape of the rib was based on the selected airfoil and the rib size decreases as they expand from the wing root to the wing tip. The team created small cutouts for the rib on the top and the bottom for the relevant amount of the stringers to perfectly place the Z-shaped stringers. These cutouts were applied with Phillips on the corner so the lifetime of these cutouts can last longer. Cutouts for the spars were also created and split the rib into three parts, which is good for the ease of manufacturing. Assuming the rib was manufactured by forming and hydraulic pressing in the factories, this would be easier to produce smaller pieces than an entire rib. The large circular cutouts were created along the camber line of the rib. The reason to create these cutouts is for weight saving and for the fuel flow to transfer through since the team was not designing the fuel tank. Our future plans consist of designing a wing structure to attach control surfaces, um, placing the landing gear between the spars and the ribs, um, optimizing our aircraft as much as possible, and completing the fuselage attachment points along with designing the attachment uh, to transfer the loads from the shear web. This concludes our presentation. Hope you enjoyed it. If there's any questions, let us know.